Hi, this is Ed Rudiger, and I am absolutely delighted you are tuning in to hear another one of the sermons. Uh, this one, we're continuing our series, uh, Following Jesus Through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and this week, we're going to be looking at a passage from Mark 5, beginning with verse 21. Now, I'm preaching this in Sligo, Pennsylvania, Sligo Presbyterian Church, on Sunday, uh, May, uh, June uh, 27th. And if you hear something in the background as I go through the sermon, my little dog, Coco Chanel, is playing with a water bottle. So you may hear some crunching, like right now. So hear the word of God as written by the evangelist Mark. Once again, Jesus got into the boat and crossed Lake Galilee. Then as he stood on the shore, a large crowd gathered around him. The person in charge of the Jewish meeting place was also there. His name was Jairus. And when he saw Jesus, he went over to him. He knelt at Jesus' feet and started begging him for help. He said, my daughter is about to die. Please come and touch her so she will get well and live. Jesus went with Jairus. Many people followed along and kept crowding around. In the crowd was a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had gone to many doctors and they had not done anything except cause her a lot of pain. She had paid them all the money she had, but instead of getting better, she only got worse. The woman had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him in the crowd and barely touched his clothes. She had said to herself, if I can touch his clothes, I will get well. As soon as she touched him, her bleeding stopped and she knew she was well. At that moment, Jesus felt power go out from him, and he turned to the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, Look at all these people crowding around you. How can you ask who touched you? But Jesus turned to see who had touched him. The woman knew what had happened to her. She came over, shaking with fear, and knelt down in front of Jesus. She told him the whole story. Jesus said to the woman, You are now well because of your faith. May God give you peace. You are healed and you will no longer be in pain. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from Jairus' home and said, Your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher anymore? Jesus heard what they said and he said to Jairus, Don't worry, just have faith. Jesus did not let anyone go with him except Peter and the two brothers, James and John. They went into the house with Jairus and saw the people crying and making a lot of noise. <coughs> Then Jesus went inside and said to them, Why are you crying and carrying on like this? The child isn't dead, she's just asleep. But the people laughed at him. After Jesus had sent them out all out of the house, he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples and went to where she was. He took the 12-year-old girl by the hand and said, Talitha ka'um, which means little girl, get up. The girl got right up and started walking around. Everyone was surprised, and, but Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Then he said, give her something to eat. Now, there's an old joke about these two guys who were talking when one of them mentioned something about faith. Immediately, the other guy says, I don't want you telling me anything about faith and all that religious stuff. I'll tell you, it's a lot of baloney. You know, I've had some financial issues that have been keeping me awake at night. Well, I made up my mind to do what all you church people say. I decided to trust that God would get me out of this mess by letting me win the lottery. Man, I even prayed about it. I trusted God. But that was six months ago. And what has it got me? Squat. So I'll tell you, you can keep that faith business to yourself. And after he'd finished his little rant, the other guy pauses for just a moment and says, it might have helped if you bought a ticket. Of course, like I said, this is an old joke. I, I know I've used it more than once myself. But I'll tell you, if you think about it, well, it, it really says a lot about faith, in particular how faith is shown by uh, a lot of people. I mean, even when we've made the decision to trust God, you know, something we talked about last week, I think a lot of folks are still pretty passive in living out their faith. For example, even though they may have made all the right decisions, they're still a, a little bit vague, you know, a little, little bit unclear in what they actually believe and confused about what they should do about it. 
And even if they've decided to put their faith in the one who has the power to still a storm, they still seem to be kind of timid, hesitant to really do anything about it, and dead silent when confronted with someone who might disagree. And I'll tell you, even when they've acknowledged that God loved them way before they cho- chose to trust him, a lot of them still sort of close themselves off from anything that doesn't fit into their assumptions. In fact, they're so intentionally blind and deaf, they actually ignore or simply miss the miraculous that may be happening all around them. You see, even though they've decided to do exactly what we talked about last week, and they've made the conscious and intentional decision to trust in God, how they choose to live out that trust often seems pretty passive. You know, like the guy in the lottery ticket. And I'll tell you, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. You see, we're going to use the two stories we just read to consider how our faith can become a little more engaged. As a matter of fact, I believe in this story within a story. I believe they point to three pretty clear and definitive characteristics of what I'm calling an active faith. And so that's what we're going to look at for the next 15 minutes or so. And hopefully by the time of by the end of our time together, we'll all have a better understanding of exactly what an active faith is all about. And like I said, I believe we can see these three characteristics in the story of the woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years and the story that surrounds it. And I'm talking about the one dealing with uh, Jairus and his 12-year-old daughter. For example, when we take these two healings together, first, I think it's pretty clear that an active faith is really focused. I mean, instead of being sort of vague and unclear and confused, the kind of trust that's engaged and involved and the kind that offers genuine peace, man, it has almost a laser beam focus on what and on whom. And like I said, I believe we can see that in the two stories we just read. I mean, just think about the woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years. Now, in my opinion, she knew exactly what she wanted, didn't she? Not only had she been bleeding for over a decade, according to Mark, she had gone to many doctors and they had not done anything except cause her a lot of pain. She had paid them all the money she had, but instead of getting better, she only got worse. I mean, she knew exactly what she wanted, didn't she? But more than that, she was also crystal clear about the one she believed could help, could help her. Again, Mark wrote, The woman had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him in the crowd and barely touched his clothes. She had said to herself, If I can touch his clothes, I will get well. I'm telling you, this woman was focused. And I'll tell you something else, so was Jairus. You know the guy with the sick child? And I believe that's why he knelt at Jesus' feet and started begging him for help. And that's why he said, my daughter is about to die. Please come and touch her so she will get well and live. You see, like the woman, as it related to his trust, this guy was focused. And you know, our faith can be focused too. And it starts when we're honest about who we are and clear about what we need. You know, that we're, we're kind of this, well, mixed bag of strengths and weaknesses, of hopes and fears. And because of that, we really could use someone to make us well and whole. You know, to still the storms that bring us down and to help us feel closer to God and to one another. Now, that's what I mean by honesty and clarity. And along with that, we can also focus our attention on the one who can address our needs. And right now I'm talking about Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, even though he was really clear that following him wasn't going to be a cakewalk, and the discipleship really wasn't for whims, he also said, if you're tired from carrying heavy burdens, come to me and I will give you rest. Take the yoke I give you and put it on your shoulders and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble and you will find rest. And personally, I believe that's exactly what will happen when we're clear about who we trust and why we trust him. You see, an active faith is focused. That's one. And second, I also believe it's courageous. It involves boldly moving beyond what makes us comfortable and and confronting, when necessary, those who may mock us. You see, this kind of trust is shown when we're willing to both step out and stand firm. And I'll tell you again, I think we see that in both these healing stories. 
I mean, this business about boldly stepping beyond our comfort zone, man, that was certainly the case with the woman, wasn't it? Personally, I think it was pretty bold to step out and to touch Jesus' robe. But her courage didn't stop there. You see, when Jesus felt power go out from him, he turned to the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? Man, she was anything but timid, wasn't she? According to Mark, the woman knew what had happened to her, namely her bleeding had stopped. And instead of blending into the crowd, she came shaking with fear and knelt down in front of Jesus. Then she told him the whole story. Now, to me, that showed courage. And I'll tell you, so did Jairus, a major league community leader, a man of power and influence, a guy who was respected by others. In my book, it took guts for him to ask a traveling preacher for help. But more than that, his courage was put to the test after he got news that his daughter had died. And after Jesus said to the mourners, why are you crying and carrying on like this? The child isn't dead, she's just asleep. Something that caused everybody there to laugh. My gosh, in their mind, Jesus was either a flake or not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Now, just imagine the strength it must have taken to go with Jesus into his daughter's room in the face of that laughing crowd. And yet, that's what he did, because his active faith was courageous. And my friends, ours can be too. You see, we don't have to be timid, and we don't have to be hesitant. And we sure don't have to stand around like a bunch of silent dummies when confronted with opposition. Instead, we can muster up the courage to face a world that seems sometimes confused and chaotic and threatening. And we can stand firm in the face of all the distractions that are trying to divert us. Because we believe the one in whom we trust can still still, still storms. And can heal sicknesses and can even raise the dead. And you know, for me, when I compare that with the kind of stuff that threatens to sink me, man, I have good reason to step out and to stand firm. You see, an act of faith is courageous. And that's two. And third, it's also open. And I'm talking about open to receive what God is offering and ready to respond. In other words, we're we're not so locked up and closed down that we actually end up ignoring or simply missing the miraculous that's happening all around us. Instead, an act of faith is open to all kinds of possibilities. And I think that's something else we see in these stories. For example, with the woman... Remember how the bleeding stopped when she touched Jesus' clothes? Well, after she'd been physically healed, if she had just pretended that when Jesus said, who touched my clothes, he was talking to somebody else. If that's, what she had, if that's what she had done and then tried to blend into that crowd, she may have missed something that was even greater than the physical healing itself. I mean, after she fessed up, she had the opportunity to hear Jesus say, you are now well because of your faith. May God give you peace. You are healed and you will no longer be in pain. You see, because she was open to possibilities that were greater than she had initially imagined, she received not only a physical healing, but also wellness and peace and comfort. And as to Jairus, he initially came to ask Jesus to heal his sick daughter. I mean, that's all he needed. But because he was open to all the possibilities, after he heard that she'd passed, he got to see Jesus take the 12-year-old girl by the hand and say, little girl, get up. And when he saw his daughter get right up, and he saw her walk or saw walking around, he'd have missed all that if he had decided to limit both his vision and his faith. And you know, I don't think we should limit ourselves either. You see, we can be open to the miraculous all around us, and we can be ready to enjoy the peace and the comfort offered by God. In other words, if we work as hard as we can to keep our eyes and our ears and our hearts open, I believe we're going to see and hear and feel amazing things. You know, a little later in the gospel, Jesus is going to say this to his disciples. If you have faith in God and don't doubt, you can tell this mountain to get up and jump into the sea, and it will. Anything you do, you ask for in prayer will be yours, if you only have faith. Wouldn't it be sad if we decided to close ourselves off and to limit the power of God? Just think about what we'll miss. 
I'm telling you, an act of faith is open. And that's number three. You know, although it's wonderful to make a decision to trust God, if we really, really want to win the lottery, we should buy a ticket. And I'll tell you, if we want our relationship with God to move beyond a decision, we really need to recognize that it was never intended to be passive, you know, vague and timid and closed. Instead, we can live out what we believe by being focused, engaged, and involved, and by being courageous, willing to and able to step out and to stand firm, and by being open, ready to accept and ready to respond to the possibilities that God has put before us. In other words, we can take the decision we've made and develop an active faith. Amen. Well, I'm so glad that you listened to this sermon. I hope you found it helpful. Next week, we're going to continue to move through Mark, so I don't want you to miss that one. And until I have the opportunity to talk with you again, I want you to remember that you are a child of God, and God loves you very much. Goodbye for now.